You probably already heard about the Bank of Canada's big switch last week, stating that they were going to pause interest rate hikes at least for the time being, but what you might not have heard is that in a rare move, they actually predicted what was going to happen with the housing market over the next year, which they almost never do. This is coming at the very same time that politically, tension is rising in Canada to address the housing affordability issues we're dealing with, while some are even calling for the introduction of new policies to intentionally crash the housing market, claiming that that's our only solution. So let's talk about exactly what the Bank of Canada predicted and why, how politicians are saying one thing about housing and are actually doing something totally different, and the radical and honestly painful ideas that some see as the only solution. So let's get right into the information. This is the monetary policy report that the Bank of Canada released just last week. And, and by the way, if you haven't already done so, make sure to subscribe to the channel to keep on getting financial updates just like this one. But deep inside this monetary policy report, we actually got some insight on the Bank of Canada's views on housing. You can see this chart where the blue line represents residential resales, the green line rep represents renovations. Um, but what's most important here, I think, is the red line, which uh, indicates the sales to new listing ratio. For those who don't know about the sales to new listing ratio, this is the number that kind of predicts what type of market we're in, whether we're in a buyer's market, a seller's market, or a balanced market. Typically, anytime you're between uh, 60 and 80% on this ratio, um, we're in a, uh, a seller's market. Anytime we're between 40 and 20, we're in a buyer's market. And anytime we're between 40 to 60, which is where we are today, is apparently a, a balanced market based on this statistic. And the current pressure on current homeowners as well as potential new buyers in the market is exactly what the Bank of Canada is trying to do right now. They say that the rise in borrowing costs is expected to continue to strain many household budgets. Interest payments on household mortgages are estimated to be about 4.5% of disposable income at the beginning of 2023, up from 3.2%. The Bank of Canada wants to quell spending in the economy, bring down spending to reduce inflation, and this is one of the main tools they're using to do it, attacking the housing market by increasing interest rates so that people don't have any money left to spend on other things that... Um, would traditionally, if you bought more of it, cause inflation, right? And here's where they start making some more predictions about the housing market, although it's not just this. We're also going to flip to a clip of Deputy Governor of the Bank of Canada, Carolyn Rogers' uh, statements on this, a video clip of it. But they say that the pullback in housing activity that began in 2022 is expected to continue over the near term. House prices are projected to decline further, particularly in markets that saw significant increases during the pandemic. However, they say that gro growth in new construction and housing resales will likely pick up halfway through this year, supported by low inventories and the continued strong demand from immigration. Of course, the Liberal government has set a target of 500,000 new Canadians each and every year over the next three years. So it's already getting interesting here, but let's go to a live clip from Carolyn Rogers at the press conference just after they released this report, and then we'll talk about it in more detail. Does the bank have an expectation of what the magnitude of house price declines will, will ultimately be, whether it's 20% or 30%, and and just given the decline in longer term uh, bond yields, especially the five year, and the uh, that home sales are starting to edge up again, do you, do you see that the, the downturn in housing overall may be uh, much milder than, than maybe others might be uh, predicting? We saw a real run up in prices and activity uh, during the pandemic, um, that was an unsustainable level of act, unsustainable level of activity. Um, it has come down since then. We do expect, as we outline in the NPR, that that uh, pullback will continue in the first couple of quarters um, uh, of this year. Uh, but as you also pointed out, there are some fundamentals that we think uh, will lead to a pickup again later in the year. Um, immigration is picking up again. Um, so we do expect housing to come back. And, and you are right, a housing, uh, housing cost mortgages are priced off the bond market in Canada. So as those prices stabilize and come down a bit, uh, we should see that show up uh, in the market. That, that may have some, some help in, in a rebound, but, but we do think there is a, a little bit further to go for the housing market to come down a bit. So the Bank of Canada essentially calls the bottom of the housing market and when they think that's going to be. They say after the first two quarters of 2023, headed into the summer, like July, August, those months, we could see a pickup in the housing market again if we were to believe the Bank of Canada because they say that there are certain positive signs for housing that they see in the future. The first one being these high immigration levels that we just talked about previously, but also the direction of bond yields. If you're not familiar, mortgage rates often are tied to bond yields. The Canada government 
liquidated bonds, uh, both five years and 10 years. And generally when we see a decrease in the yields of those bonds, we also see a decrease in mortgage rates. And if we see a decrease in mortgage rates, well, that will certainly be a positive pressure on housing prices. And this is really odd for the Bank of Canada to do, to come out and give these projections and these guesses as to what the housing market's going to do and actually communicate that, leading me to believe that perhaps they are planning something that they haven't communicated to us yet. Perhaps they see that halfway through the year, they actually might be on the path of lowering interest rates again. But of course, right now they're saying it's way too soon for them to be talking about a world where they're lowering interest rates. But well, sometimes what they say isn't exactly in line with what they end up doing. But given that house prices are slowly declining, but affordability is getting worse at the same time, tensions are rising and they're rising quickly in the political landscape as opposition party leaders have started to get aggressive with their questions to Trudeau around his housing policy. Take a look at this. After eight years of this prime minister, mortgage payments have more than doubled from $1,500 a month to over $3,000 a month. After eight years of this prime minister, rent, has more than doubled from about 950 bucks to over $2,000. Why does he keep governing for, for the super rich instead of the ordinary Canadian? Everyone in this country should be able to find a home that meets their family's needs and it's in their budget. Sadly, that's not the case. People are struggling to find a home that they can afford. And the rent under this prime minister, since he's taken office, has gone up by 60%. It's a massive increase. And people are struggling. The Prime Minister hasn't built the homes he promised he would build, nor has he tackled speculation that's driving up the cost of housing. Why has the housing crisis gotten worse, not better, under this Prime Minister? Over the past eight years, we have consistently stepped up for the middle class and people working hard to join it uh, with investments in uh, rental ben uh, benefits for low-income renters, uh, with investments so that all families can uh, take their uh, kids to the, uh, to the dentist. Uh, these are the kinds of things we've invested in that have not only benefited Canadians, but created a strong and growing economy. The Conservatives have had nothing to offer but a recommendation around Bitcoin. It's why we've introduced the first-time home homebuyer incentive, why we committed over $82 billion to the national housing strategy and supported the creation and repair of almost half a million homes. We announced a rent-to-home program. We've helped more than 2.6 million families get the housing they need, and we're working to ensure that every Canadian has an affordable place to call home. So in response to these concerns from the leaders of the opposition, Trudeau talks about the $500 payment to roughly 50,000 of Canada's lowest income renters, and he talks about the billions of dollars invested in the NHS, which is the national housing strategy. But many renters will only marginally notice that rental benefit support since it's only a one-time payment of $500 and rent is uh, uh, far higher than that. And the national housing strategy is an entire other story after the parliamentary budget officer came out and reported that many of the organizations that the national housing strategy is funding doesn't actually know if the spending is making housing more affordable for Canadians. I've actually made an entire video on that. So I'll link it right here for you. So in many people's eyes, this response from Trudeau just amounts to bragging that they've spent more on housing than anyone else, but with less results than that spending would suggest they should be getting. And uh, perhaps that's exactly what the government wants in a situation like this, to sound like they're doing good work on housing while actually not moving the needle. And this sentiment is echoed in a recent Globe and Mail opinion piece where they say our politicians, however, often seem paralyzed by conflicting interests, namely those of current homeowners and the investors who benefit from the status quo versus the growing contingent of the young and less affluent who suffer as a result. So politicians are essentially at a crossroads. They've got voters on both sides of this issue, voters that want their house prices to remain high and voters who need the house prices to come down in order for them to be able to afford home for their family. But if they can make it sound like they're trying to solve the problem, I'm talking about affordable housing without actually talking about house prices going down, well, they get the best of both worlds. In reality, there's only two things that people can look to that may actually have an impact on housing, one of which Jagmeet Singh brought up in a recent interview. Change the market because the market has been designed in a way that it benefits wealthy corporations. It shouldn't be that a first-time family or a first-time home buyer has to compete with a billion-dollar uh, corporation that's buying homes or apartments because they see it as a profit-making scheme. They shouldn't be pushing out a family that wants to start and grow their family. That is a problem that we're up against. And there's changes that we can make. 
that will disincentivize or discourage these, these wealthy corporations from competing with families that are just trying to find a home. But it's not just left-leaning political parties like the NDP who are claiming that we have an addiction to the financialization of our housing market as the main issue. Um, here are actually some recent comments from Amanda Lang, one of BNN Bloomberg's lead journalists. The problem that we have, I believe, in housing is, yes, it's supply and demand, and to Kevin's point, it's a decades and decades slow-moving problem. We're all aware, why don't we just build more homes? The problem is we have financialized our housing system. We've turned it into a capital markets asset, and the solution may be more financialization and capital markets products around housing, or this is in our control. This is why I think we shouldn't stop talking about this. We take it back. We, we remove the concept that your home is going to be your best investment, and we go back to what it was historically, which was a store of value. You made money, but you basically kept up with inflation over the lifespan of your home. So when you needed to cash out of it, there was the money. It felt like a lot because we all lose track of the, the growth power of inflation. But we get rid of this idea that we're going to make a killing on homes and that some people will make more than others and it's an asset to trade. It's bad for us, mm -hmm. but it's good for all of the participants in the market, and there are many, right? This is the biggest sector of our economy now, when you add them all up, and it's good for everyone who's already in the game. So the dirty part of this problem is none of us want to change it. We're in it. <laughs> so let someone else, now what might fix it? A strong mayor might fix it. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's not running it for a fourth term might fix it. <laughs> Uh, because they don't have political capital to, to lose. But the politics of housing is the problem. It's a third rail. We, it is not a financial problem. It's not a supply and demand problem. It's a decision that was made for all of us. We got to take it back or stop whining. She again points to financialization of the housing market and the same incentives we were talking about before for politicians. Nobody wants to risk the political capital that they have if they were to uh, put forward policies that would actually cause housing prices to go down. Now, the second thing that we could look at that would potentially help the situation is dramatically increasing the supply of housing in Canada. This is something that, that Pierre Polyev, the leader of the Conservatives, as well as Jagmeet Singh, are both saying that they would do if they were Prime Minister. However, some believe that this actually won't solve the problem, giving some rather shocking numbers that have been reported throughout 2016 all the way up until the uh, beginning of 2022. This article takes a close look at Toronto, one of Canada's largest housing markets, and they claim that housing unit growth is actually growing faster than the population in this city at the very same time that prices are going up. It goes on to say that the number of private dwellings in Toronto uh, rose by 7% um, over this time period, but meanwhile the area's population grew by less than 7% at 4.6%, uh, according to the census figures which were released uh, back in February of 2022. They say that this calls into question the often cited idea that a shortage of homes is a major reason that cities like Toronto, that their housing prices have soared to record highs. Instead, they point to rampant speculation, pointing out that the uh, owners of multiple properties now constitutes the largest segment of home buyers in Ontario. So the claim here is that even if there were a dramatic increase of supply of housing in Canada, and even if that increase in supply were to outpace the pace of immigration in Canada, that might not even be the silver bullet if there isn't a simultaneous definancialization of the housing market like we were talking about before. So the Bank of Canada is warning that prices will likely fall over the next six months while politicians are claiming that they want to help find a solution to this situation, but at the same time they're worried that their voters would be unable to stomach a prolonged decline in housing prices, and unfortunately the easy road for all politicians is to sound like they're going to do something while never actually getting anything done, so they sound good to voters who aren't in the housing market, and also um, um, the homeowners can sort of see through that their policies aren't doing anything um, to impact their housing prices. And obviously we covered a lot in today's video. I'm curious what you think about it. What do you think of the Bank of Canada's prediction, this uh, sort of unprecedented uh, idea that they've actually given a prediction on where the housing market is going? What do you think about that? What do you think of the state of politics today and how, if they actually can do anything about housing? Do you think we're going in the right direction, the wrong direction? Let me know down below in the comment section. I read every single one and I try to get back to as many as I possibly can. Uh, and if you haven't already done so, make sure to subscribe to the channel for more Canadian focused financial content. Just like this and with all that said uh, i hope you found this video enjoyable and i hope it helped you out at least a little bit and i'll see you next time <laughs>